Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Positively Responding to Spirit Influence. And it is part of Spirit Relationship Series. It was presented in Mergen, Queensland, Australia on the 7th of October, 2012. This is Session 2, Part 1. It's 11 o'clock too early in the morning for you. <laughs> it's funny in Queensland, isn't it, where we... Uh, like I've, in the southern states, we generally slept in until you know, 7 o'clock or something like that. Here it's a bit hard to do that, particularly in summer, isn't it? <laughs> it's more like a 5 o'clock, 4.30. <laughs> yep. uh, we find when we're sleeping down in our tent, it's like, wake up at 5 o'clock. Yeah, it looks pretty bright. Time to get up. <laughs> so how are you all this morning? Pretty good. Um, I suppose I better do the honours. <laughs> how did you find the talk yesterday? Oh, yeah. It's going to get transcribed straight away. You feel Barbara's passion in that. I, I was going to ask you, ladies, who have been doing so much transcribing, do you sit here and transcribe in your head while we're talking? <laughs> I'll do the pictures on the board. You do the picture. Hopefully You're you do a better picture than that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Back in the old days, I would have drawn a muscular man standing there with his suit of armor. <laughs> Yeah, um, we feel that uh, once you understand how spirits hook into you and, and understand what you can do to combat that, to, to actually, that, that's all to do with your own emotional state, then there's so many things that uh, you're not affected by anymore. Most of, most of us are heavily affected by negative influence from spirits because of what they are allowed to hook into inside of us. So that's what we'd like to talk more with you about today. Mm. There's no housekeeping things we need to arrange today, I no. don't think, is there? So, oh yes, maybe one thing we need to mention. The ladies' toilets has a little block, has a, a, a quite a large blockage, um, somewhere outside, but uh, it, it can cope with occasional flushing, but, but it sort of can't cope with the everybody going there at the break and using it all at once. So, um, so you need to um, be aware of that. Face yourself, hold, cross your legs. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what yeah. was that? If it's yellow, <laughs> let it mellow. <laughs> and if it's brown, flush it down. <laughs> okay. Okay. Who came up with that one? Was that you, Joy? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's working already. It's leaking or already. Or leaking already. Mm. Mm. So um, if you can just be aware of that, ladies, with the toilets, um, hopefully they'll fix that this week. And we'll try not to go for three hours before we give you a break like we did yesterday. So you're not all in a rush. <laughs> Sorry about that yesterday. Yeah. I, I sort of lost track of time and because uh, once I do that, then I'm t I have no idea how long it's been. <laughs> now, today we'd like to cover the rest of this suit of armour, shall we call it, that we, can, that we can put on that helps us with spirit and also helps us, ironically, and as you would expect, helps us with influence from people on the earth as well. The difference between the people on the earth, of course, and the people in the spirit world is that we just cannot see the people in the spirit world who are inf influencing us. And many times we interpret the words coming from them as our own thoughts. And this is where it becomes uh, very muddy for us when we're influenced by spirits. When we're influenced by a person on earth, you would have them sitting down right in front of you, usually, or standing up in front of you, looking at you, saying the words, and you, can, you know at least who the source of these words are from and you can also feel their attitude towards you better because you, you're right in front of them. But when the person is unseen, it just makes it a lot more difficult unless you're very sensitive emotionally um, and can feel the difference between their thoughts and your thoughts and their feelings and your feelings and so forth. Um, while you're open in these ways that we've described, 
it, it can be often very confusing and, and very easy for our spirits to influence us. And that's why so many spirits are earthbound, because they find it very, very easy to influence the majority of the population. So um, shall we proceed with the next part? Sure. Should we hear the, uh, hear the verse up to where we've covered and on to the next? Yeah. yeah. So maybe we'll read it from the English Standard Version this morning. I like to mix them up. <laughs> mix up the versions. Yeah. No favouritism. No. <laughs> Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm." Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil ones and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplica supplication for all the saints. <laughs> <laughs> so we're up to, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which yes. can, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Yes, so let's look at this shield. Um, for many of us, uh, when we first begin investigating divine truth, um, the shield's like this. <laughs> right? And it's not very effective. <laughs> and so, so, you know, it barely covers anything. And, and it's pretty much not usable. But as we progress, uh, and in particular, as we progress receiving divine love our faith grows because once we've got a connection with God or we've established a connection with God, then our faith grows. The, the problem that we have is how do we have faith when we are just in that infancy stage of discovering truth? And this is where some basic principles about faith we need to keep in mind. To actually have a large shield of faith, as one of the other um, uh, translation says, what we need to do is to, is to have the ability to grow our faith, but also hold on to a few basic logical principles that will assist us with our faith. Some of these logical principles are surrounding God and God's nature. So we need to have at least a, a, an understanding and some kind of faith that God is better than we are. In other words, that God is more loving than we are and therefore better than any person that we've ever met here on the planet in terms of the expression of love and also the expression of kindness, compassion and other emotions like that. You see, it's our lack of faith most of the time in God that causes us to have a lack of faith in our process of discovery of truth. And what I mean by that is, if we do not have faith that God is good, then it's going to be very, very hard for us to have any faith that we can ever discover truth in the, in, in the future at some point. And it would be very difficult for us if we do not believe that God has goodness and so much goodness that God wants to share the truth with all of God's children. This is a primary part of our faith. So this is one of the things that we need to firstly logically understand. But, but as we progress and start establishing a relationship with God, we'll start feeling God. And then we'll have more strong, a stronger faith because we can feel the truth of that logic. But we need to begin somewhere. We need to at least begin with some of this logic. So initially when we start, our shield might be quite small, right? And our shield, being quite small, 
is established initially through this ability to be able to use our brain in a logical way to determine what God's nature may be, even though we've never really had any personal interaction with God. Then, as we receive divine love, our faith grows because we've now had a personal relationship with God or we're establishing one. And as we establish a personal relationship with God, we start learning about more and more and more of God's laws. We start understanding the truth about how God thinks about things and feels about things. We start seeing our relationship with God, that we can establish one and actually have communication with God, where God lets us know through this emotional communication the truth about the world that we live in and the universe that we live in. And as those interactions grow, the number of them grows, our shield grows. And eventually what we would like to have is a shield that covers our whole form, right? That protects all of us, all of our personal being, our soul, from anything that may be aimed at us. Now, you can see in that process that at the beginning of any discovery point, that is the time when you are the most easily affected by the influence of other people. So if other people shoot some, like it says in one of those translations, darts at you or flaming arrows, you know, back in, the, uh, back in our time in the first century, that's how they used to often conquer people who had uh, shields that were so large. They used to shoot flaming arrows with tar on them and eventually the wood in the, in the shields would catch fire and then, of course, the person would throw his shield away, and that was the way to get through the, the, per, the person's defences. So, so here, if, we, if, our, if our shield is made of more solid substance, and faith is a far more solid substance, then any time any arrow or something that's burning comes at us, something that's intended to harm us or destroy us, the, the faith itself, held by our soul, prevents the influence from occurring. It prevents that action from somebody else from damaging us at, a, at the soul level. So, so what we need to do is think about our faith and how to build our faith. Now remember, I gave a talk about faith, I think it was in 2009? Was it? Or, or 10 or something like that? Um, and uh, I think it was at Butterham. Yep. Yeah. And in that talk, I described in a lot more detail how important faith is for your life. And now I'm not talking here about religious faith. I'm talking about faith in almost everything that you do. For example, to have a relationship with your partner, you've got to have some faith that, that they want to have a relationship with you in return. They might say they do, right? But you don't know for certain, and there has to be some faith in order for the relationship to start to become established. If you have a new pursuit, something that you're investigating for work or for, for, for something that is one of your desires that you're investigating, you always need some faith that you might discover some more truth about that particular thing. That's the whole point of doing it. If you had no faith at all, no... Uh, idea that something beneficial will come from the interaction, why would you even begin it? So we, we actually have faith in many areas of our lives most of the time. A person who picks up a new musical instrument only does so because they have the faith that at some point in the future they'll be able to learn how to play it. And they have the faith that if they go through a certain process, they'll be able to learn that, that particular instrument well enough to play it and, and enjoy it themselves and perhaps even others enjoy it. Without faith, you would never even bother doing that. And yet it's right at the beginning that it's the most difficult. You may imagine if you picked up a musical instrument, you started playing it, and this is how you'd be going if it was a guitar, ding, 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 you know, like, and, and nothing's coming out very well, right? And you're just sort of discovering how to press the keys, and it's often buzzing at you as well, instead of the noise. And, and if, if at that point in time, everyone around you said, you're an idiot, you're terrible, you're never going to be good at this, and all those kind of things, and you had no faith, 
what would you do? You'd just give it up straight away. Right? But as soon as you have some faith, no matter what anybody around you says about what you are doing, you still have the internal conviction that you are going to succeed. And this is why faith is so important. Can I ask you some questions about that? Mm. So in this instance, we're talking about warding off spirit influence. So our faith is in something in God, in God being good, yep. would you say? Yeah, that's how I feel the basis of the faith, yeah. And for me, when I feel about faith, it feels like the thing that fortifies my strength to walk in ways of peace. Um, would you agree with that? Yep, is that definitely. Yeah. And yep. so when we have this shield of faith, it's, it's the, how does it help us combat spirit influence directly? Well, like uh, Paul mentioned, the spirit influence is like flaming arrows coming at you constantly, pretty much. Um, that's how many of the spirits in the spirit world are acting towards us on a daily basis. They, they want to attack us, they want to harm us, they want to humiliate us, they want to laugh at us, they want to make fun of us, and some of them even want to kill us, right? That's the way it is uh, with many of their emotions and that's the way they feel. So, so what we need to do is to go, okay, this is the stuff that's coming at me. What is going to help me go through all of that stuff and still maintain a relationship with God and still maintain a relationship with ethics and love? What's going to help me get through all of that? Can you see that in a way... Faith is probably one of the only things that is going to help you do that. Faith that things are going to get better. Faith that your own condition is going to improve if you get through this. Faith that uh, God is good and God wants to give you more love. Faith that you can become at one with God even. So nobody on the planet has actually, who's been told they can become at one with God has ever become at one with God on the planet. So to actually have faith in it, you, to, to actually continue this path, you're going to have to have some faith that it's possible. Does that make sense? You're going to have to have some faith that it's possible. So that, and that's what I had to develop myself in the first century, faith that this was possible. What I knew that uh, based on my logical reasoning that God is good and that God was better than I and that God had as much love as I wanted to receive to give to me, I had to focus on those particular emotions and that allowed me to develop faith and then develop this relationship with God. And as the relationship with God grew, my faith grew. So as I received more love, the faith grew. As I received more love again, it grew again and so forth. It's very hard to have faith in something when nothing is happening. Have you noticed that? Like, it's very hard to have faith. Like, when, if you look at a relationship, if your partner is saying, yes, I want to be with you, and then every time you walk down the street, he or she is looking at somebody else, <laughs> and then every time you're not there, you hear they've flirted with this person and flirted with that person and so forth, do you think your faith is going to be very big? Of what? the person is saying to you? Of course not. For faith to be established, initially, we've got to have some trust that what is being said to us, or trust that, that, that it is actually true. But then time and some kind of effort in a certain direction will either prove it to be true or not. But it's only when it's proven that faith really begins to grow, isn't it? You can't really have faith without something being proven to you in the end. And the only way that can happen on this path is for it to be proven to you through your personal experience. It doesn't matter how much information I talk with you about, until you've had a personal experience of it, you will not be able to have faith that it's true. Right? But you might have some logical faith, at least some in intellectual faith, in the sense that you might at least try it to see if it's true. And that's where we need to start with the quality of faith, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, if yep, we go sorry. to the question, yep. um, Natalie, please. I've had, um, <coughs> I've had times in my life where I felt my faith has grown and then I feel f from outside influences like it's being tested incredibly yeah. and 
then I feel like I don't... I, I question um, the experience that I had that caused my faith to grow in the first place and then I find myself giving up on that, going, OK, it wasn't real. And, yes, and this brings us to our next thing, though. So, okay. you know, there's, there's a mixture of things going on here. One is that faith is built from some kind of personal experience and then you have another personal experience which knocks around your faith a bit, so it's like chipping away at this the shield that you have and and we don't generally under those circumstances hold on to logic right we become very illogical no it's easy to hold on to doubt <laughs> yes and 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 one, and in fact doubt is an emotion that we create because we're afraid okay so can i just say that to you again because many of you <laughs> I don't feel realise that. Doubt is an emotion we personally create because we are afraid of something. Can we not even call it an emotion? Because you can't not, even it's process really emotion, it. It's a though. state. It's a state. Then is, am I afraid that what I have faith in is not real? Yes. So feel the fear of that. Okay. Yep. Or you have uh, not used your logic. Like, you know, what we often do is we have an experience and then we have another experience that confirms the first experience and then another that confirms the second experience and we have four or five experiences in a row that all confirm the truth about something that we seem to be growing in knowledge of and then all of a sudden uh, we have something go wrong in our life, right? Now, at that point, what most of us do is we throw away all of those experiences in our mind because they are all past experiences, right? We throw them all away and we only focus on our current experience. Now the problem with doing that is firstly it's not very logical. You've had all of these past experiences which have all established something at least and we, by throwing them away we're actually throwing away a lot of our life and experience in this process of what we've learned. No, it's not a very logical thing to do. But also when we're having this negative experience, let's call it, this one that's got a bit of pain in it, and we've got that experience going on, because we're so focused emotionally on this experience, we have a tendency to forget about any logic in the experience. And this is a very damaging thing to do. And this is why I gave that talk in Melbourne about logic, emotions and truth. Because we need to have a mixture of logic and emotions to discover truth. Right? We can't just focus on our emotions because sometimes our emotions are going to be very negative and also out of harmony. Some of them we actually purposefully create in order to avoid other things. Right? For example, rage is an emotion we purposefully create generally to avoid something else, fear. So, so if we trust our rage, we're not always going to be in harmony with truth. We need to have some logic going on in the background which checks us and which also reminds us of the previous experiences, right? Now, faith establishes those experience, is established by those experiences. But faith also has this unique quality in that it is future looking, in that, in that we look into the future with, with a degree of hope and a feeling of belief that we are able to achieve something that we currently cannot. So, so I often use the example, right, of, of flight you know people had to believe that it was possible right before and and there's plenty of proof that it's possible birds do it every day so there's plenty of proof that it was possible and and so we had to believe that it was possible for humans to do it before they would engage the process of trying to construct something or experiment with the construction of something that may support flight but if there was no physical evidence around them it, imagine how much more difficult it would have been to construct the first aeroplane. Yeah. It, it, there was nothing to copy, there was nothing to, to, um, to even prove that it was possible. Yeah. Uh, that would be very, very difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah. And in a lot of ways, this is how difficult it is to becoming at one with God. At the moment, for, for all of us, there's no one around proving to you that it's possible. So you don't have a bird flying when it comes to you know, the issue of becoming at one with God, who you can say, there it is, that's what it looks like, that's what it feels like, that's the kind of thing I want to know. Right? And that is the difficulty we face. We're actually, what we're discussing with you is, is a process 
that nobody has yet achieved in front of you. And that's where faith becomes difficult. Because that is, and that's going to be all about your relationship with God and reminding yourself about your past experiences. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question about that. Um, what, you're, what you're talking about is um, actually having faith, though. We, we're used to building faith in ourselves, aren't we? When we pick up the guitar, we have faith that I will learn this. But this shield of faith is constructed of faith in God, isn't it? Not in our, in our own capacity. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you um, would mind sharing with us some of your experience with faith in the first century when you were becoming at one with God? I actually feel that it's both, uh, faith in yourself and a faith in God. Yeah. It, whenever you're discovering something new, you've got to have some kind of level of trust inside of yourself, don't you, that you're capable of understanding it and capable of doing it. Now, that, that is about faith in yourself to a degree, isn't it? Also, you, many of people, when they look at something new, they go, but if I follow that and it happens to take me down the wrong path, then my life will be a mess. Now, you won't think that if you have faith in yourself. Because if you have true faith in yourself, you'll, you'll feel yourself going down the wrong path and you go, oh, I'm gonna, I can change this at any time. Mm. I can fix this at any time. I can stop and choose another path. You have a belief in yourself that's a, that what I would classify as a faith that it's possible for you to see something going on that you do not like or you cannot accept and then to change your mind and to walk another path. Now, if you have true faith in yourself, you will accept that. If you don't have faith in yourself, you'll accept what everybody else tells you. And this is how many people stay in religions all of their life when they don't really agree with it, right? Because they continually accept what everybody else teaches them without actually, you know, feeling for themselves whether it's right or wrong and then trusting their own feelings and having some faith in themselves that they're allowed to walk a different path. Now, God has given you free will, so God is allowing you to make any choice you wish at any time you wish and you can change your mind any time you want. So you might listen to AJ for six months and go, yeah, it's a crock of rubbish. Uh, and it might not be said quite that politely. And, and then you might go, uh, no, I'm not going to listen to that. And then, you know, three years later, you hear about it again or something. You go, oh, yeah, I remember that. But last time I thought it was rubbish. So I don't, but I'll have a listen. And then you listen, oh, maybe things are not so much rubbish anymore. And, you'll, and you can change your mind at any time, right? The beauty of the discovery of truth on this planet and in the spirit world is that you are allowed to change your mind at any time. And in fact, you are so allowed that God will not punish you for changing your mind because God is good. God will never punish anybody for changing their mind or making a mistake. Right? It is our belief systems here on earth that prevent us from changing our mind and it is our belief systems here on earth that do not allow us to con contemplate making mistakes. If we have faith in ourselves, we will contemplate walking in a direction that is potentially a mistake. Knowing that we have enough knowledge and enough feeling in our heart to determine whether it's a mistake or not, at some point in the future if it is, and then to change our mind, to change the course of our life. This is what self-determination is all about. So in the first century, uh, with the question that Mary asked, I had to first have enough concept of myself to understand that I could change my mind and discover new things whenever I wanted. So this was a great help to me. And, and at a very young age, and I'm not really sure why, but at a very young age, I could feel my parents had certain opinions and I couldn't agree with them. <laughs> And unlike most people on earth, I didn't feel like I had to either. Right? And, so, and so by the time I was 11, 12 years of age, working with my father um, in you know, carpentry and building business that he had, I would sometimes argue with him. I would sometimes say, look, Dad, I can't agree. And particularly when it came to discussions about the Messiah. My father was a Pharisee and he was very focused on, you know, the Messiah coming, and he was also very focused on trying to force me to believe I was the Messiah uh, in the first century. And, 
And I would often reason with him about, you know, what does he expect the Messiah to be? Oh, well, this, you know, this, this basically warrior king is what he wanted. And I said, no, no, the Messiah is not going to be like that. And my father would disagree and then we'd have a bit of an argument about it. And, and I didn't feel like I had to agree with him. Why do we feel like we have to agree with people? Because we're afraid. Because we don't have any faith in ourselves. We don't have to agree with anybody. You do not have to agree with me. I'm not expecting you to. All I'm doing is presenting some things to you and giving you the space and time to do what you want with it, whatever that is. Right? And that's, that's all anybody can do who, who presents anything to you, isn't it? Isn't that the same thing that happened when you were at school? Although I don't know if they gave you the space and time. <laughs> you know, there's often a, like, a deadline, Friday, test you know and you're there Friday you know uh, swatting up for the test this divine true stuff is not like that you're not swatting up for anything this is life this is that's why we call it the way it's the way of life now you can choose to follow it or choose not to or choose to half follow it or quarter follow it or one eighth follow it or or, or five percent follow it like it's really up to you does that make sense if you have some faith in yourself you will be able to do that and then later on decide to change your mind if you want to. So you won't have fear. You know, a lot of the people who say, ah, oh, it's a cult starting and it's this and it, you know, these people want to control you and they want to take all your money and all these kind of things. All these things that are said are all said because people are afraid. It's not their personal experience with me. It might be their personal experience with somebody else, but it hasn't been their personal experience with me that they're talking about. They are just afraid. When we have some faith in ourselves, we are not afraid of making a choice that we later go, oh, it probably wasn't such a good choice, and change our mind. We're not afraid of that. So I feel the first level of faith is all about having some kind of faith in yourself and your personal ability to intellectually and feeling-wise acknowledge truth and see when something's wrong and to question it. I don't believe it gives you the right to be angry or in a rage about it, just to be able to question it and change your mind and change your course of life as a result. So if you have faith, at least in yourself, you will be able to do that. That is the beginning of faith, I feel. Once you start doing that and you start developing this relationship with God and using a bit of logic, which we'll talk about in a minute, once you start doing that, you start establishing faith now that comes through relationship with God. And this is very similar to like faith that would come through my relationship with Mary. So initially we might have, we might establish a relationship. So it would be Mary and myself in a relationship with each other. And initially we might not know each other very well, right? When we begin. But over time and experiences, I get to know Mary's character and she gets to know mine. And this allows faith to either grow in the character and nature of the other person or to be destroyed when you think about it, doesn't it? The more you get to know the person, the more you might either see their integrity or their lack of it. You might see their sexual integrity or their lack of it. And as time goes on, your faith in that person will either grow or it will diminish depending upon the experience. And what I'm suggesting with this shield of faith is our faith will grow once we have this personal experience with God. And this is why we said at the start of this discussion yesterday, relationship with God is something we must never forget when we're talking about the principles of the way, the path to God. It's not about avoiding your pain. It's not about making your life better. It's not about, you know, becoming some superhuman. It's not about any of those kind of things. What it's about is relationship with God. If you establish relationship with God, your faith will grow. But, it, but relationship with God can only be established through this feeling process with God. But as your faith grows, you now become more firmly convinced. And, and people in the first century were so convinced that they were willing to stand in an arena with 100,000 people around them shouting for their death and have a heap of lions come out and tear them to pieces. That's how much faith they had. And that's a lot of faith, right? To be placed in a situation like that and still trust God's goodness. That's a lot of faith. 
because they had not yet become at one with God, but they still had enough experience in their relationship with God to know that God was good. Yeah. So that's what I feel the importance of this thing is. Now, if you look at our spirit influence issue with this, can you see that if you have a little bit of faith, or none at all, somebody just has to make a suggestion to you, and you will go off on another road. Right? If you have no faith in yourself and no conviction, no internal conviction in yourself, somebody about to suggest, oh, yeah, you're not a very nice person. You'll be thinking, yeah, that's probably true, you know. Somebody, somebody will be able to say to you, oh, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, we all come from Martians and everything. Oh, yeah, mate, that's, that's a good, I'll go down that level of investigation. And, and, and I'm not saying don't go down that level of investigation. I'm saying that if you, or before that point in time, firmly did not believe that to be truth after you've investigated it, but somebody can just speak to you and then you're off on that course of action, then that, to me, indicates a problem with your own faith in yourself and your own faith in your own analysis. In addition, if somebody suggests to you, let, and this is more the suggestions that are these coming at us from spirits, you know, oh, you know, that woman over there, just check her out, you know, have a relationship with her, and you're already in a relationship with somebody else, right? Um, and if you're so easily led that you just walk off and do it, then that means you've got no faith in yourself, you've got no personal integrity, you've got no honour of the truth, your feet are running to some kind of violence in a relationship, and there's no righteousness involved, your heart is being led by a desire that's out of harmony with ethics, and there's no conviction. So, so what's going on there? There's no faith at all, even in yourself, in that place. So I, I believe that faith begins firstly with some faith in your own ability to make your own choices and decisions and to determine the course of your own life. The second layer of faith comes when you choose to make the choice to connect with God through a relationship and in the experience of that relationship, you feel God and now your faith in God and God's goodness will continue to grow. And that will convince you whether the divine truth is the truth or not, right? That's what will convince you. Yeah. Can is, I... is there any, you want some more questions? Uh, yeah, just some clarifiers. Is that Fire all right? away, yeah. darling. <laughs> Don't be bashful. <laughs> I feel a bit bashful today. Yeah. Um, it seems to me you're talking about the shield of faith and um, that we first build it uh, in terms of having a good sense of self and a knowledge of our own will and our own capacity to make decisions and a knowledge of our own character. What is my desire? Do I want to be a good person? Do I want to... Mm. Um, what are my intentions? Do I want to grow? What are my intentions? So, yeah. And then it seems you say, then through that and through exercising that, we can begin to develop a relationship with God, which then gives us faith that God is good and God does want what's best for me and God will support me if I follow his laws. And also that God has the capacity through that relationship to educate me, to, to tell me more truth that I have not currently understood or, or obtained. Yeah. And so what occurred to me as you were speaking, just like a little symmetrical line, was that in order to have a good sense of myself, I must be humble. And in order to develop the relationship with God, I must also be humble. So mm -hmm. they seem like partners in a, in a dance that I have to marry together, this mm -hmm. desire to know myself and to know God, yeah. which I know we talk about ad nauseum. Yeah. But then also um, when we're talking about the Can flame... we talk about it ad nauseum? <laughs> Do all of you feel sick to the stomach? <laughs> at how much? I love talking about it, but sometimes I think people feel a bit sick. <laughs> Go on. Um, but then it occurred to me that the flaming arrows, that's a lot about the ways that um, we can be most attacked is when we're attacked through our, uh, about our sense of self yes. and attacked about the nature of God. Yes. And, and then I was feeling about how many of us have carry these feelings of terrible sense of worth and terrible disillusionment with God. Yep. And if, if we were to start there, then that's the building blocks of faith and it also protects us against further attack on those issues. Yes. Yeah. No, that's okay. very true. Uh, does everyone understand what Mary's saying? That, that if, we, if we, we... We're often getting attacked, right? Through, through these arrows coming towards us. We're often getting attacked. 
And obviously, there's, there's got to be some way to repel the attack. If we can't repel the attack, then it's going to hit us. And, and potentially, you know, if we we're in a war here, one arrow hit in the wrong place, and you're a goner, right? And this is often the case spiritually mm -hmm. as well. One arrow hit in the wrong place makes us often a goner for, for many years. Sometimes I've seen some people hundreds of years, some of our friends in the first century, 2,000 years, and they're still a goner in the sense that they are still in the place where they're angry, resentful, rageful, in the hells. And these were our friends who knew us, right? Because of some offence that they took, because of some uh, underlying emotion they were unprepared to feel, the lack of humility that they had. And they're still there. You know? So, that's so if we build our shield based on this knowledge of myself yep. and then growing into this certainty about God, yep. I'm going to be able to repel all of those attacks. Yes, yeah. and also with the knowledge of ourselves, I feel it's very important to understand it's not just a knowledge of yourself, but a knowledge of your capacity to change your mind at any point. A knowledge that you're allowed to make a different choice if you want to, at any point in your life. You know, this is where I feel there is a huge problem with most organised religions on the planet and also most other pursuits. They force you into a certain train of thought and then if you change your mind, what happens? You get condemned, degraded, humiliated, you know, all sorts of methods to keep you under control, right? This is not your relationship with God. God does not do this with you. So even if I did that with you, God does not do that with you. Does that make sense? God never does that. This is what is important to understand. If we mic over here. Thanks. Linda. Uh, uh, with Linda. Linda, sorry. You Keep your hand your up, hand Linda, up. so yep. people can see. Yep. That's it. So, um, is this on? Yeah. I'm just trying to see if I've got it in my mind clearly. What, I'm under, what I think I understand is if I have faith in myself, that faith in myself will help me to determine the source of the, the voice or the thought or whatever. But it's faith in God that will help me to determine the loving action or the, love, the truth of it. Is that right? Well, obviously, um, the faith allows you to continue on your path. Mm -hmm. Whereas what the truth is will be determined through mistakes and other things you might do and you'll yeah. get feedback. Okay. So I don't feel the faith necessarily will help you decide what is the right or wrong thing to do. The faith just keeps you plugging away at trying to find out what is right. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Whereas other things such as, you know, truth and, you know, looking at ethical behaviour, as we talked about yesterday, and moral behaviour, these things determine what is right and what is wrong. But even if you don't know what is right or wrong, faith will keep you plugging away at discovering the truth about that. Because you have a faith that God wants to give you all truth. So the faith in God is really that, that faith that no matter how many mistakes I make or, or how many wrong turns I take, God is always there saying, just hang on a minute, have a look at this. You know, maybe you want to consider this and that. Yep. And, so, and God is always and loving you. Loving you. Yeah. Always loving you. Yeah. Yeah. Every mistake you make, God's not like a parent that goes like this and bends you over and belts <laughs> you on the backside. God's not like that, right? Every mistake you make, God realises there is an automatic thing that goes on because of the laws. Every mistake you make, you feel. You'll feel sooner or later. God knows that. So God doesn't have to punish you for anything that you do wrong or, or reward you for anything you do right, actually. Either the reward is, is intrinsic in what happens in your life. And so once we start to understand that just God is always good to me, no matter how bad I am, no matter whether I chose to be bad or made a mistake and was bad as a result of a mistake, God is still good to me. And if I have that amount of faith in God, that God is always good, then I will plug away trying to discover the truth, even when I get attacked by other people, even when everyone says I'm an idiot and so forth, I'll still plug away. 
So it's the faith in God that keeps me going. It keeps me going, yeah. yes. Can definitely. I give an example from my yeah. life? Yeah. yeah. Um, so for me, yesterday we talked about girding our loins with truth. And truth is the things that I know for sure. So it, as we talked about yesterday, when I carry those things, even in my head, but also in my heart, that does help me stay safe spiritually a lot. But for me, faith is... So we get attacked a lot, for example. And whenever there's a media campaign, you know, we get a slew of emails telling me that I'm a silly woman or that I, you know, a slut or they want to do something horrible to me or um, we're actually ripping people off and the poor people that I'm going to hell and all of you poor people that I'm hurting and like all kinds of stuff. And how could I ruin my family and all, all, all kinds of things. So these feel like arrows. <laughs> um, and sometimes when I feel really low, they hit me, <laughs> you know, I've, I, and I go into a place of feeling terrible about myself. I think, wow, the whole world feels like they're against me and what is really going on? <laughs> you know, is it really bad? <laughs> um, and, I, I, you know, I haven't got everything figured out. I haven't really come to terms with who I am. I really, and I get into this thing, I really should have it all figured out. I should be perfect. Am I doing exactly the right thing all of the time? You know, what about, what if somehow this is all wrong and all of this horrible thing can happen? But if I bring it back to faith, and sometimes I've had to go really low in that place in order to remember faith, really. Um, and if I know that, we talked about the two aspects, knowing myself and, and having this feeling for God. If I, if I search inside of myself and I know, hey, I know I want truth. I really know my heart is to serve. I really know that I want to grow. I, re I know these things about myself. And so if I keep walking in that way in humility, things can't go worse. <laughs> you know, they're only going to go better. And if I know, I know I have received God's love, I know God loves me, no matter what all these people feel about me, God loves me. And I have faith that God will bring me truth because I've had that experience. God will bring me truth if I keep desiring it. Now that helps me ward off so many arrows because I go, hang on, when it all comes down to it, I don't have to know all of the truth right now. I just can walk in faith, knowing this about myself, that I don't want to harm anyone, that I really sincerely desire forgiveness and, and, and love for everyone in my life. If I, if I walk with that knowledge, and I also walk with the knowledge that I, no, I don't have, God, I know I'm not perfect yet, but I know that you're telling me I'm lovable and that everyone around me is lovable, then I can keep walking towards truth and I don't have to have it all right now. So Mary, in that example then, um, it, or, or when you go into the spiral down into those periods of self-doubt, those are the flaming arrows coming at you, aren't they? The, the barbs that are shooting at you, trying to, to push you off the course, trying to it foster self-doubt. Yeah, it, trying to... Yeah foster self-punishment, yeah. really, and yeah. it, that is really spirit attack. Yeah. It, because it, it, I'm it is also another thing, though, isn't it? It's, it's For Mary, there's still this feeling that the way to avoid the rage of others is to be upset with herself, and that, and that sort of then alleviates the rage of others. Does that make sense? If I, if I question myself, I don't have to feel how painful this is that other people are doing this to me. Mm. So there's a... As with everything, you know, in my spiral, if I'm self-reflective, I learn a lot about my emotional self. And that actually happens far less than it used to because I've recognised this desire to placate rather than feel. Yeah. So the, the faith in yourself then is where, where you're recognising, no, hang on a minute, I know this. I'm not like this. Yeah. I know this. Why am I, why am I all of a sudden accepting this yeah. when a week ago I knew this about myself? And, and even if you've done something wrong, Linda, it's, it, it, even if you've done something wrong on purpose, you can still sit down and go, okay, I definitely did that wrong and I definitely did that on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but what's my underlying intention? 
Is my underlying intention to fix this, to make this better, or if, do I still want to do even more things wrong? Now, if you are self-analytical enough like that, yeah. you'll go, okay, if my intention is to make it even worse, then I need to have a very go good, strong look at myself mm. to analyse my own intention. But, but if I believe that I am capable of change, I will at least believe that I'm capable of analysing my intention, even when it's negative, and change it. I'll believe that. And this is what I mean by the kind of faith you need in yourself. Yeah. Yep. And many of us have evidence that we can change now, don't we? And yet sometimes we reach these points where we go, I, can't, I did it wrong and I can't change it. And it's not true. Because as you spoke of earlier, we have the evidence of, of past experience to show how I'm not the person I was three years ago. So, so we're not really suggesting that you need to have faith that you're a good person, even when your actions would demonstrate that you're perhaps not so good, no. right? What we're suggesting is even if your actions are demonstrating to you that you are doing things that are out of harmony with love, you need to have enough faith to know that you can always change your life. You can always change who, who you are by actually analysing and feeling your way through why you are doing the things that are, are negative. And, and this requires humility to examine yourself, but it also requires faith, a belief in yourself that you're capable of change. Because otherwise you'd just throw your hands up in the air and say, I might as well be as bad as I can be. And to be honest, a lot of people on the planet have actually made that choice. Yes. That they've made the choice to be as bad as they can be because they don't have any faith that they can be better. And can I say, I've been that person too. You know, I shared with all you guys a lot of things I've done in the sleep state that, where I was just like, I'm bad and I'm going to be bad and I don't have any faith that I can change and I'm angry about what's inside of me. And it took faith to move from that place and, and I'm different, you know. It took faith not only in myself but this, this is where a relationship with God is so beautiful. The knowledge that God loves me even through all of that also helps each of us to change. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. That's really helped to clarify that. So if you can imagine, like in Mary's experience, where she was doing those things in the sleep state, if there was no faith available, like inside of Mary, she probably would have also thrown her life away on earth to a large degree, right? So, so rather than actually being self-analytical, going through the process of humility, realising what's going on and wanting to change it, there had to be some faith all through that process that she was capable of doing that. Does that make sense? And that's why faith is so important. Yeah. Faith even in yourself is so important, even when you are bad as you could be. <laughs> even if you're a murderer and a rapist and a, you know, whatever it is that you can think of that it's the worst thing that you could be, even if you're those things, having some faith that you can change is such an important quality to help you grow. Yeah, right. and, and often uh, some of you guys share with me seeing... Me change gives you faith. And so we can look around us as well and say, well, I've got evidence, even though I feel like I'm a terrible person and I can't change, I've got evidence from just seeing people around me that it is, you know, we're all equal under God's eyes. They can change, I can change. So there's a, there's a lot of ways we can build faith as well. Now, if you even just held on to the faith of that one thing, that you are capable of change in a positive direction, can you see how much less influence spirits would have on you than, than allowing yourself to get into big depressive spirals, go, oh, I might as well give up, it's all pointless, you know, let's go and have a drink and go out and have sex with this person, have a, let's just, just, just do everything possible that's bad, you know, I might as well give up. And uh, there's, a, there's a way we call that generally but I just can't remember it at this point. Oh, just, uh, you know, just this whole give up and then just be as bad as you possibly can be. And, you know, that only comes from a lack of faith in yourself. Mm -hmm. Throw the towel. Throw the Throw towel, in the towel. In. yeah. <laughs> as the saying goes. Yeah. If we come there and then up the back with Josh. So here first. Who's got the mic on that side? Yeah, Aurelia Karen. here. You don't have to squat down, Karen, over there. <laughs> <laughs> You're not in the way of any camera. Um, hello. 
Hello. Um, I feel like I've got the self-trust thing more these days, but um, there's like faith in God. Like how do we strengthen that? Because I feel like I have faith indirectly, sort of like I pray about something and then my prayer gets answered. I'm like, wow, God's really there for me. Um, but how do we strengthen that feeling? Like well, can I first say to you that um, faith in yourself is not the same as arrogance. Thanks. Okay. okay. And arrogance is where you feel that you're better than other people or you feel that you know more than other people and that you're more worth, you know, have more worth than other people or, or those kind of emotions. Faith in yourself never becomes arrogant. So it's very important for many of us to understand that just because you've heard divine truth, that doesn't make you better than anybody else. And just because you might practice it, that doesn't make you better than anyone else in God's eyes either, actually. Right? Yeah, I kind of meant more like um, the trust to, in myself to follow what I feel and... Yes, but what, I, what I'm what suggesting I, for you personally yeah. is that there is, this, there is also this arrogant part that is developed is, yeah. where you do feel better than other people who are not there on the path or do feel better than other people who are not practising the same thing. You feel like you know more and understand it better and those kind of things. That's not the kind of trust in ourselves that I'm speaking of. In fact, that kind of trust in ourselves indicates there is a problem yeah. And it, that needs to be addressed. So that's very different than having a, pr a pure faith in yourself, which is a faith that in your ability to be humble and see everything clearly, eventually, by following a process. And, uh, and that kind of faith isn't arrogant at all. It's very open to people saying things to you and everything else. It's even open to getting hurt. But it allows itself to hold on to the pathway of correction, right? So that's one part. Oh. The second part of your question. Oh, I just wanted to clarify, like are you, so you're suggesting to me then that if I develop my real self-trust, not just this self-deceptive thing that I think I've got going on, then yeah. I will strengthen my faith in God as well. Well, you will naturally be more humble and that will uh, naturally, you'll naturally then see more things coming at you that need to be corrected. And as a result of that, but you'll have enough faith in yourself to know that you are able and capable of correcting these things with God's help. So, so this is where our faith and trust in God has to also begin to develop. Once we have faith and trust in God, we start trusting that even though it looks impossible to me at this point in time to change something inside of myself or feel my way through a certain emotion that looks terribly overwhelming or become a different type of person than I currently are, that from God's perspective, change is possible. And with God's help, all change can occur. And then we start actually putting more trust in God than we have even in ourselves. Because if we, if we analyse things right from the beginning... We can see that we ourselves are imperfect creatures, are we not? When we start this process, we are imperfect creatures. All of us are imperfect creatures. God is not an imperfect creature. God is perfect in all his ways. Everything God does is perfectly attuned to everything in the, in the universe because everything is based around love. Everything that God does is based around love and truth. Because God is the perfect creature and I am the imperfect creature, as my relationship with God grows, my faith in God is going to become greater than my faith in myself. Does that make sense? And my trust in God will become greater than my trust in myself. That makes even logical sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If a person is perfect, they are more trustworthy than the person who's imperfect. Even if the person who's imperfect is yourself. <laughs> right? So, so we can trust people uh, or somebody, any creature, including celestial spirit beings and so forth, who are more perfect or perfected than us. We can always trust them. In the spirit world, when we arrive in the spirit world, anybody who's brighter than me, I can trust more than I can trust myself. <laughs> so you imagine you arrive in the hells in the spirit world and you get really dark and then this person comes along and he's a bit brighter than you. He's not much brighter, but he's a bit brighter, right? This tells me straight away, I can trust him more than I can trust myself. 
So I, I should have a listen to what this guy's got to say, right? Because he, he's more trustworthy than what I am <laughs> myself. Now, if I had a celestial spirit, if I was in the spirit world, I had a celestial spirit come, he's really bright and he's quite large and bright and he's very happy and joyful and his life is demonstrating that. I go, wow, you know, I'm a bit dark. He's really, really bright. I can trust him a lot, right? I can trust him probably with everything he's got to say almost, right? That's when I get out my notebook. Right, what right, you get to you tell know? me? <laughs> you know, and, and away he goes and you listen there and you listen there. Whatever time he's willing to give you, you know, you'd love to have, right? Because, because he's a person who is more trustworthy than, than even your own self. Now, let's look at God. God is the most trustworthy being in the entire universe. Eventually, we will come to see that if there's a disagreement between myself and God, <laughs> who do you trust? <laughs> well, you trust God, not myself, right? <laughs> if there's a disagreement between myself and that very bright celestial spirit, who do you trust? The bright celestial spirit, right? Because they are brighter and therefore more indication that they have more truth and they have more love. And this is what will happen with us as we grow. We will get to the point where we understand that our trust and, and faith in God will, will sort of start growing out of our faith and our trust in ourselves. It will be like a seed. The fertile soil is that faith and trust that we have in ourselves that we can change, that we can grow, that we can become better people and all these kind of, and we can become more loving and more happy and more joyful and all those things. That's the seed. We start growing, but in, a, in its growth, in this connection with God, we start growing so much that we start realising that actually I don't have, hardly need to trust myself anymore now because I've got another person who I'm in contact with more, more constantly and now I can trust God more than I can trust myself because God is better than I am. And so I can always trust somebody who's better than I am far more than I can trust myself. And that's what I feel the relationship is between the two faiths, if you like. Faith in yourself, faith in God. Yeah, that's really humbling, actually. Yeah. I can feel the difference. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If we go right up in the corner uh, with the pram yeah. back there. And uh, if we and go to start at the front, maybe. And over then here back. Uh, Anna. with Anna as well. So up the back there. Yep, yeah. thank you. Hi, Jay. Um, I'd like to ask, because I, after your talk in Brazil, I'm from Brazil. Yes. And I felt um, about the, the spirit guides, they, they thought they are guiding us, mm -hmm. right? And it's so easy to, when maybe you're in a spirit body, you, you know who you can trust, which guides you are able to trust. Yes. But here we, we cannot see, and we are thinking, we in Brazil, we thought there would be guiding for um, yeah. high level spirit guides. We think, are they better than us? So we give our power away to them. Yes. So how do we, f do we know like, which, which of the spirits are brighter than us and who we can trust? Well, firstly, may I point out that whenever we give our power away to anybody, we are automatically out of harmony with love of ourselves. Even God does not expect us to give our power to God. God gave us power as a gift we can then use. God doesn't want the gift back, <laughs> like that we have to somehow give our power back to God. So, so what God wants us to do is to use the gift of our power, which is also very similar in a way to the gift of our will, in a direction that we have a passionate desire to. That's, that's first. Now, if we have... An underst basic understanding of truth, we are ethical in our behaviour and we've got this shield of faith where we have a, a firm connection with ourselves that, that has developed, where we understand that we are always capable of change and we're always capable of growth and we have feet that are not running to violence all the time but, but that are standing firm for truth all the time. What will happen is anybody who converses with us, who tries to convince us of something different to that, we won't accept the conversation. We may converse, but we won't internally go, oh, I've got to do what they're saying to me. 
the big problem we find with many people who deal with spirits on a daily basis is that they automatically accept what is being said without feeling or about any of those factors, whether their will is being influenced, whether their faith is being influenced in the direction that they don't want to go, whether they're being influenced into some kind of violence or some kind of attack, whether they're being influenced away from the truth they have already received. And this is why a lot of people I feel who are in spiritual circles find it very difficult. They give away their power, as you said, to the spirit, and that's no different than giving you away your power to any person on earth. It's exactly the same thing. Not something that God would agree with and not something that God wants you to do. But it is something we need to look at emotionally why we do it. And the reason why most of the time we do it is because we do not want to take personal responsibility for our own choices and decisions. Which is an ethical thing. Remember we talked with the heart yesterday about ethics. That's an ethical thing. If I want you to take responsibility for my life, I am not being ethical with you. So quite frequently, we see in spiritual circles, people are not being ethically honest with the spirit, and therefore they're going to attract spirits who are not ethically honest with them as a result. If I'm ethically honest, I'll go, I don't want this spirit to tell me what to do in my life, or to tell me what I should do in my life, or follow their directions on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to make my own decisions and choices, but I want to bring those decisions and choices into harmony with love. If the spirits are going to help me bring those choices into harmony with love, then I'll accept their help, just like I would accept any person's help on earth who want to do the same thing. But if those spirits want to influence me to give away my power to them and give away control of my life and I wake up every morning going, what do you want me to do? And I go and do that. Now I am completely out of harmony with ethics and love. And also, I have no honouring of myself. You know, remember the loins go to the truth was about honouring yourself and your right and your, your own will, your own power, your own choice to make decisions that you can make any time you want and we don't give away that power to others so so I feel for many spiritually you know people in spiritual circles they are so used to giving away their power to others they give away their power to a minister they give away their power to an organization such as a church or a, or, or anything like that or they give away their power to spirits or they even try to give away their power to God thinking that that's even possible. Look, one thing we need to all come to terms with, God's got enough power of her own. <laughs> she does not need yours. <laughs> so is, so is, is that the reason why the spirits, they, they thought they, could, they were helping us and guiding us because we, we, we gave this responsibility to them? Yes. Yeah, when you give the responsibility to somebody else to guide your life, that person, if they are not ethical in their nature, will take that responsibility and run with it. But they, they think, they believe, they really truly believe that they are loving and they are bright and they, they are guiding. I agree, but the reality is just because a person believes they're loving, it doesn't mean that they are. This is where if we have some faith in ourselves and faith in our relationship with God, we will finish up discovering who is loving and who is not. That's and right. whether they say they're loving or not won't make any difference to us. We will, we will guide the choice by why, how they have acted with us yeah. and how that feels to mm -hmm. us. And, uh, and in our relationship with God, eventually we'll sort that out even. Yeah. So sometimes when we do that initially, um, it, we may think certain things are loving that aren't. But then as we grow, as we go towards God, we iron those things out of our life and then we realise, wow, Back then, I thought it was loving to just go, you know, pander to somebody's emotions, you know, like I, I thought that was loving. But now that I've grown a bit more in love, I realise, wow, that's not very loving. It's actually helped the person not take responsibility for their life, helped the person do a lot of damaging things to themselves. So I can see that's unloving. Just because a person claims they are loving, it does not mean that they have learned how to love. That's right. It's just their current understanding of what love is. Yeah, I think it was beautiful that you went to Brazil. Thank you for that, because I think you opened the mind and the hearts of many people, even the spirits, that they realize in the, uh, in the arrogance they live in, 
and was beautiful um, that the truth is coming out to them. So yep. hopefully uh, there's going to be in the future a better work with the spirits and, and us because yep. in Brazil I feel so many mediums, um, they're already giving, like, love, like lovely, they they work in the spiritual centers and they, they want to help. The, yes. the intention are really good. Yes, but I the, agree. But the, the, the work needs to be more in harmony and loving. So it was beautiful that many spirits start to realize that they need to grow. They have a lot to grow and a lot more to learn. Yep. And hopefully in the future, um, we, can, we could all work together in, yes. in a loving I, way. So thank you. I feel very strongly that um, places like Brazil have huge amounts of potential only if they recognise that there are the spirit influence and the spirits themselves who are influencing recognise that the spirit influence on the people is not yet in harmony with love as, God's, as God defines it. Um, I feel once that happens, there is so much potential in that country for growth. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Um, who are we next? Hello. Could I just add yeah, something sorry. to that? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, just barge in, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mary's feeling a bit shy today. I, am, you I don't that? know what's going on. Anyway, um, something we talked about uh, um, through our exploration of Through the Mists was um, the fact that God has demonstrated a lot of mercy for us here in the nursery of our soul on the earth plane in that consequences aren't immediate. Uh, we have time to figure out we've made a mistake and remedy it before we're, you know, consigned to the hells and, and in a really horrid environment. Um, and something that I, occurred to me as you're talking about this idea of uh, there's a difference between trusting and giving away our power. And trusting is, is about having a relationship with someone but also staying very connected with ourselves. And this idea that God is demonstrating a lot of mercy to us here, that we're able to stumble, get back on the horse, stumble again, figure things out and learn before there's immediate justice or consequences placed upon us. And in doing that, it, it means that we develop all of these qualities really, really firmly within us. If we just arrived in the spirit world and everything was, oh, trust the brighter one, do the, you know, can you see how we, we miss an opportunity to really discover and, and develop these qualities within ourselves? So I feel that's a real gift. Often we feel frustrated, like, why can't I tell who's the brighter one? You know, in the spirit world, this would be much easier and why this is hard and, and all of, but if we can embrace that process as a process of actually developing the qualities of faith, understanding truth inside of my soul, really understanding what is right, what is right in, in the eyes of God and the heart of God, those kinds of things, I feel that we see, start to see the gifts of the mercy. Yeah. We find that many people who have not developed these qualities on earth and arrive in the spirit world, spend many, many years trying to develop the qualities and, and have a lot of difficulty generally. The people on earth who have developed these qualities, no matter what religious faith they are of or non-religious faith they are of, like they might even be atheists who have developed these, some of these qualities, of course. So, so the people who have developed these qualities are often the ones who do the best in the spirit world. Right? By They'd, far and wide, yeah. The people who do not develop these qualities on earth come to the spirit world devoid of them. And when you come to the spirit world devoid of a whole heap of really important qualities, it's very, very hard to develop them when you're in an environment that is not conducive to developing them. So you imagine if, uh, if we did not develop any of these qualities and we arrived in the spirit world without any of them, we'd arrive in the spirit world on usually in the hells of the spirit world or in the first sphere of the spirit world every person around us would also not have any of those qualities. Now, can you imagine how difficult it is to develop these qualities when you've got no one mirroring it, no one talking about it, no one discussing it, no one mentioning it to you, no one helping you understand it, no one modelling it as a role? It's so difficult to learn under those circumstances. This is the opportunity we have here on Earth. And also, this is why the natural love path flourishes in the spirit world and, well, in the spirit world, let's say. And on earth. And on earth. Mm. But because when you arrive in that state without having developed any of those qualities and someone comes to you who's brighter who says, you just need to do this different thing, then you change your action and not necessarily your heart. 
and so faith hasn't grown and understanding of truth hasn't grown, you just begin to modify yourself in order to get to a brighter location. And the soul work hasn't even commenced. And that's why for a lot of people, they get to the sixth sphere and realise, I've got to go all the way back there and really start to know my soul and develop my soul. Um, so I just feel there's so many gifts in this experience. It feels messy. It feels painful. We feel like, whoa, are we ever going to get it? But there's so many gifts. And I just see so much beauty in all of you guys who are taking these steps because um, these qualities, you know, this much faith developed here is like that much faith when you get there. <laughs> um, because people who have none find it really hard to, to develop yeah, once is, they hit the spirit world. Yeah, yeah, it is possible to act lovingly without feeling more love. Many of you have already tried that. And you know that it's possible. <laughs> it is possible to act more lovingly without feeling more love. On the way, the path to God, you're going to have to feel the love before you will start acting more lovingly. Right? That's the primary difference between the paths, right? And, and this is what, these are the qualities that are going to help you develop in this love. By, once you have these qualities, you'll constantly want this relationship with God. And that is what is going to help you have the love that you are able to then automatically display to others without having to try. Remember, I keep saying this many times, without having to try. So at the moment, if you think about it, many of us have to try to be more loving before we're more loving. This is an indication that we've yet to really be on this relationship with God. Because if you develop this relationship with God properly, you get to the point where you don't have to try and you are more loving. It's not, not something you've got to struggle to do. This is why most religious forms on the earth don't work, because everyone's in a struggle to try to be more loving rather than the heart actually changing and the heart becoming more loving. And we need to have enough faith to understand, and in God to understand that God's love will transform us if we only have this connection. God's love will transform us into this point where we receive divine love and it changes us to, and helps us become more loving by the reception of it, through the reception. Yep. Oh, Anna, oh, Anna, 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 we were next. Um, I think... Yeah, just hang a second now. Yep. yep right. I think part of my question has already been answered. But um, when you were answering Aura's question and you were talking about trust and, like, you'll see a brighter spirit and you'll just go, oh, I can trust this person. Um, I was just laughing my head off because that just feels crazy to me. Like, it feels, it feels sorry. like... Oh, crazy. 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 Yep. Like... I have to get out of my own way to be able to do that. Yeah. Like, like I'm so, like, just scared of um, not. I don't know. It's you know like, what most people who see a brighter spirit in the in the in the spirit world initially do? Yeah, run. <laughs> <laughs> They're more trustworthy than they themselves are, and they're running. It's like you, the person they need to start running from is themselves, really, <laughs> logically, <laughs> under those circumstances. But instead they start running away from a, a spirit. Or they go, yeah, he looks a bit strange. He's a bit different than I am. Is he some kind of other creature or something? You know, like, that, that's or, they they or they, they feel they judged. Or they feel judged. They immediately and feel they're going to be judged. Yeah. And get enraged. You know, how dare you come to me? How dare you? You know, this is a normal reactions of people who arrive in the spirit world. You know, and you, you'll see some more of them in the, in the discussions in the book group, even like where there's more and more of those interactions shown where somebody really bright. And I think there's one line in, the, uh, in one of the books that Robert James Lee's wrote of, of the, the old saying, you know, you trust that you... Um, with about the patience of angels, you know, you're, you're taking advantage or something of the patience of angels. I can't remember exactly how it goes. But there was a man there who arrived in the spirit world in rags, you know, like obviously in a very dark, dirty condition. He was a minister, you like, or a... Uh, Bishop, I think. Uh, yeah, in, uh, in church. Uh, and, like um, and 
He was saying, where are my garments? Where are my garments? This is rubbish. What's going on here? Someone's made a mistake. You know, and he's right. And the, and the, and the poor angel who's trying to help him is going, uh, just listening to the rant, you know. And that is unfortunately how most people pass into the spirit world when they see a brighter person. Yeah. So um, any tips any on t- how to trust more? <laughs> well, Anna, first tip is uh, how old are you now? You're 25. Um, now, uh, even, if, uh, even if you have a bad life, there's a good chance you'll get to 75 or so, isn't it? So rather than me giving you tips about <laughs> the spirit world, I would prefer to give you some tips about the life you're living on earth. And I think this is what, you know, these are the kind of things that we need to develop, these qualities. Because when, you, when you've developed these qualities on earth, you arrive in a spirit world, you're automatically attracting all the things you need to grow after that. Yeah, yeah. But if you, if you arrive in the spirit world without any of these qualities, can you imagine? You, you're probably going to be quite attacking of other people. You, you, you know, you're still going to have very similar emotions. You're not going to have developed any sense of worth, sense of ethics, sense of peace, sense of truth, sense of faith. And, and as a result of that, these, all of these senses will still need to be developed at some point in the future, but it's going to be very difficult because you're going to be living with a whole heap of people who also have not developed those qualities. If you develop these qualities on earth, you will eventually be attracted to a group of people who are also developing these qualities, no matter what faith they are, not religious faith they are of, no matter what walk of life they take, no matter what country they live in, you're going to attract them. But then when you arrive in the spirit world, you will also attract people around you who have already developed these qualities and can feel the longing inside of you that you want to develop the same kind of qualities for yourself. So that's going to be the most powerful positive effect on your life. Yeah. Forever. forever. Yep. Yep. Who's next? If we go, if we go man, Jason, woman, man, <laughs> woman, man. I'm a man. Hi, AJ. Um, when I've been in the hells and, and I've cried out in outrage towards God and, and I can understand that my guide or guardian is with me because law of rapport and they've probably had similar ex- earth experiences, but when I've been in a dark place and I've cried out to God and, and I can understand that God can feel everything that I'm feeling, but I, I've actually been really upset. Like, how do you truly know God? Have you actually been through the hells? Have you lived through what I'm living through or experienced? And that's where I've questioned my faith in God. You mean you expect sort of God to live through that in order for God to understand you? Well, yeah. Have God experienced, actually experienced what I've experienced? Or has God just been God from the start in perfection? Yeah, I suppose. So what, what you're philosophically huh? doing is you're philosophically saying that uh, God cannot understand me unless God has been me. Similar, like, yeah. Or do you mean God can't, God can't have compassion for me in this place because God's never been in it? What's the feeling? Well, for me, it's a bit of a quandary because I, I conceptually understand that... Um, my guardians have been appointed because of probably similar experiences and got through the other side. Yep, yep. I can conceptually understand that God can feel exactly everything I'm feeling. Yep. But I've been in rage, I guess, towards God going, well, how, how do you truly know? Have you lived through what I've, what I've lived through? Like, did- yes, and I would question why you're in a rage with God when God didn't put you through these particular experiences. Somebody else did. So this is where I feel we, we get our logic way out and, we, and like we said yesterday, we finish up blaming God for, for actions that other people have taken. And that's a very damaging thing to do. Um, you see, we're not actually processing much uh, emotion in that place because the real person who has damaged us hasn't been God. It's been somebody else who's caused us to have this particular feeling. And the feeling that we often have on earth, that unless you have had exactly the same experience of me, you can't understand me. That's the feeling we have, right? Mm. Now that feeling comes from somewhere. This is why we love to share our emotions. Sharing your emotions is impossible.
I might have said that again. <laughs> Many of you do this. We come up and say, how do you feel? Oh, this is an oh, that. And there's a real feeling of wanting to share your emotion, right? That's impossible. Nobody else shares your emotion. The emotion is inside of you. It's your energy in motion. It's yours. Nobody else can share it. Your desire to have other people share it is out of harmony with truth and love. Right? The fact that we want God to share our emotion is just out of harmony, as out of harmony with truth and love, as it is wanting somebody else to share my emotion. I am an individual. This is the beautiful gift God has given me to be an individual. And therefore, all of my emotion is my emotion. I can't share it with somebody else. Right? I can't. This is why you will find in the future that describing or attempting to describe your own emotion to another person is an exercise generally in futility. You might be very, very descriptive with words and be very good at it and get to the point where a person can sense the feeling, but unless they can feel you, they will not be able to even understand the emotion. And you can't share it anyway. It is yours. It is only yours to experience. And we need to understand this. Once we understand that, we will stop blaming God for the emotion that exists inside of us and we will start placing responsibility on the people who caused events to occur that created emotions that we then felt inside of ourselves. They didn't transfer the emotions to us. They created events and situations and attitudes that caused us to have a response emotionally. And those responses are our own. Only we can address them. Only we can feel them. This might be a, another, just to satisfy my own curiosity. Sure. Did God go through a development like to achieve a where God is at, or is God sort of... It is, it is another question I cannot answer. Okay. So there's number three, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why it's impossible to answer is because I don't know enough about God yet to answer the question. I, I haven't found out through my relationship with God how it, whether God had a pre, a pre some kind of existence, whether God um, had some kind of uh, creation herself or himself, I, I have not got the development to understand or, or, or even philosophically discuss those particular principles. I suspect that God has been around forever, but I do not understand how that is possible. This is my suspicion <laughs> only. I can't say that for certain and because, because I don't know the answer to the question. Yep. Oh, we'll leave that for another thousand, two thousand years. <laughs> well, I feel that we will be able to answer those, those kind of questions in time because one of the things that I've learnt through my relationship with God is that God wants us to be able to answer every question we have. Right? But one of the things I've come to realise myself is that my soul has to be developed enough to understand the answer. And this is the big problem that I feel we have intellectually, is that we, feel, we somehow feel that we can ask a question and get an answer. Most of the time, though, we are not actually understanding the answer. To, to be honest, even in our discussions together, most of you are yet to understand what your soul is. Right? And even though we've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it and talked about it, we can talk, we, I think I've given 90 talks that are on YouTube about the soul and most people who have listened to every single one of them still do not yet understand what the soul is because they yet to feel their own soul. <laughs> Once you feel the experience of your own soul, ah, now you can start to understand. And what I've found myself is that every single time I try to ask a question that I do not have the development to understand, Oh, I've got, I can intellectualise and philosophise to the cows come home, as the saying goes, but I will still not know for certain. 
I'm only going to know for certain once the soul expands enough to be able to accept the concept. It's a bit like, uh, it's a, a great way to compare it is imagine if you just going to school five years of age and instead of putting you in preschool, your parents through their wisdom decide they're going to grab you and put you in university course. You've never been to school before in your entire life. How effective do you think that is going to be? Counterproductive. Yeah, definitely counterproductive. The person is just going to sit there, be totally bamboozled by everything that's being said, and, and have no development to understand it. And this is something that we must understand about truth. You cannot receive truth without the development to understand it. So, so if you think of your soul, remember, all truth is soul-based knowledge. So if we're thinking of it from that perspective, if this is the level of our soul, it's going to be very difficult for us to anything but intellectualise about what is above the development of our own soul. Once I get to the development of that level, I will be able to intellectually go even higher than that in terms of think about what's possible. But I'll only be able to understand that layer of truth about the soul, the universe and so forth. Once I reach that development, it's the same. I'll intellectually be able to imagine things above that, but I have not yet personally experienced them. But I now have enough grounding to know that this is true. And so forth and so forth at infinitum. Right? Now, if I understand that as a process, I understand that I can be bombarded with all this intellectual knowledge about the soul and still not understand a single word at the soul level about the soul. There are many people who have listened to the divine truth for 30 years on this planet and still do not understand a single word of it. A single word. Because their soul has not grown enough to be able to absorb any of it. And so they do not understand it. They think they do. And to think you understand something is a very, very dangerous thing. Painful. <laughs> it's also very dangerous because you enter a point of arrogance. You go into a place where you think you know something that you do not know anything of. And once you do that, it is a very, very difficult task to actually learn something new. Yeah. So my suggestion is when it comes to knowledge, understand that true knowledge is only going to occur when your soul develops. And you cannot understand things higher than your soul development. You can think you do, but you won't until your soul develops to that higher understanding. So I believe, and through our personal experience, we know that we have come up with many, many ideas and concepts which we've had to throw away as soon as we had the experience. Right? Things that we thought we knew, and with us, we throw them away pretty readily. Right? So we're not addicted to holding on to them. But, but many people in the spirit world are so addicted to holding on to a concept that they intellectually believed was true because they heard all the words and they, and they interpreted it to mean a certain thing that they were not able to have the experience that would have proven whether it was true or not. So we've got to be very careful of that. Faith will always lead us through this emotional, soul-based growth process. It's our lack of faith that causes us to constantly go back to the intellect and prevent ourselves from having experience that we could be having today that would answer the truth. You see, I often have discussed with spirits, for example, whether God exists or not. There's one single simple experiment that can be undertaken to understand whether God exists or not. All you need to do is to long for God's love and feel what you receive. And as a spirit, that is quite a simple task to, to, to employ. Almost every spirit I have ever discussed with it who has been on the natural love path who is a six-sphere spirit has refused to undertake the experiment. The reason why is because they do not see any logical reason why they should, or they do not see any logical reason how it could work, or they do not see any logical reason why it would be true. They do not see any logical reason that it could be that simple. 
They want it to be far more complicated. They have a, such a high esteem of their own intellect that they believe that something so simple can be dismissed without a second thought. Which is quite arrogant. Which is very arrogant, yes. But that's how, what happens when we believe we know a truth just because we've heard the words of truth. Right? The people who really know the truth they are the people who feel and practice it every single moment of their life. They know the truth. Yep. You'll meet many of them in your future. Yep. Some of you will become them in your future. But, but it is a soul-based process, not an intellectual process. And that's the thing that we need to remember. It's a soul-based process based on faith that the soul can grow, not faith that your intellect can grow. You know, by the time you hit the sixth fear, your intellect will not be able to grow further. That's why anything, any principle that's, that's higher than the sixth fear, you will be completely unable to understand without soul development. Does everyone get that? So, so, so you imagine you, you're growing, you're growing, you're growing in intellectually, two, three, four, through the fifth and into the sixth sphere, there is your limit. Your intellect, no matter how fast it is, no matter how much computational power you have with your intellect, you will never get beyond that point, ever, without soul development. Right? God's constructed it that way because there are a whole heap of things that are only understandable by the soul. The soul has far more intelligence than our intellect. Right? And it's only, we're only capable of understanding it by opening up the soul. This is the layer of limitation that is placed upon any person who wants to discover anything through their intellect. Now, I'm not saying the intellect is worthless, as we'll soon discover. <laughs> right? However, there is this limitation. Soul truth cannot enter you through your intellect. It can only enter you through an experience that your soul has. That's the only way. So it's very important to understand that and to have faith that that is true. Part of this path that we've been explaining to you is not about, as we've talked about, it's about actually connecting emotionally to things. And that's a part of this faith. You see, people on this planet at the moment want to keep telling you, don't they? They want to keep saying to you, it's not that. You need to use your intellect. That's why they, they criticise you when you get emotional. Do you know what happens when we have media in an audience? As soon as one of you cries, the media goes, Whoonk. there's the photo, you know, that's the one they're on, that's the one they're on. You know, as Luli pointed out to one of the media people, like, there were 200 people in the audience, none of them were crying except one person. And that was the person you were saying, AJ's destroying because he's now crying. Right? And that, that's how fearful people are of their emotion. We need to have some faith that if we connect truthfully with ourselves, connect truthfully with our soul and receive divine love, our soul has the capacity to grow. When it has the capacity to grow, it has the capacity to understand. Truth will just come to us. Bang, 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 bang. This is what I loved that the interview I talked about yesterday with Dane because he mentioned some truths that just keep coming at him, coming at him because he went through an emotional experience. Yeah? That's what you explained in the interview, wasn't it, mate? So, yeah. And, and, and you realised in that place that you could be having emotional experience every single day with new truth coming every single day for a million years and still not know the truth. Yeah. And that is one of the things that comes to you through that process. And then you are no longer addicted to the intellectual method of understanding everything. You also ask less questions, interestingly. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, what is the time? How's the time, everyone? 20 to 1. 20 to 1, okay. Yeah. We'll, finish, we'll finish this session at 1, so uh, who was next? Um, yep. Pamela, and, Pamela then, uh, and then just give it a moment. Yep, it, it'll come on. Yeah. So we can ask God for God's love, mm -hmm. and in the prayer there, there are the words, "May I have faith." Mm -hmm. We are the ones who grow that faith. God can't give us faith in God. Um, no, let no. me clarify. You can grow your own faith in yourself 
through your life experience. Faith in God, though, grows only through this personal relationship that becomes established with God. When you first receive divine love from God, you will start to establish this faith in God. The faith in God comes with the love that comes from God. It's a bit, for example, if you've never walked through a wall, you're never going to have faith that you can do it. Is that not true? You might have an intellectual concept that it's possible, but you're not going to know for certain inside of your heart that you can do it right? until you've actually done it. It's exactly the same with our relationship with God. You're, you might have an intellectual concept that you can have a relationship with God, and that's a part of faith. But true faith comes from actually establishing the relationship to actually feel love enter your soul and recognise the relationship that is now being established. That's when true faith comes. So true faith grows with the reception of divine love. True faith in God. True faith in yourself grows with the building of your own love of yourself. Right? That's how true faith in yourself grows. So how can we help children grow faith? Well, firstly, we need to give them enough faith in themselves where they are able to discover new truth, make mistakes without feeling like they're going to get punished or harmed or any of those other things that we've been told. Once they establish some faith in themselves, they will start trusting their concept of the universe, which will often be very, very different than the adults around them conceiving the universe. Most children are fully capable of seeing spirits, so they are fully aware there, are a there is a spirit world. They are fully capable of feeling those spirits, so they are fully capable of feeling emotionally. They are also, all we need to do then is educate them that there, there is a God also that exists that you can feel, and let them experiment with that. The children that we've seen do that who are under the age of six or seven all do that quite easily, far e more easily than the average adult does. I think we need to take lessons from them sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like some of those, some of those are your children, actually, you know, that we've met. They actually, they actually understand more about God than many of you do. Your children do, I mean, because they have actually received some divine love from God and they, and they trust it far more than you do. They trust the feelings that they have. So the way we help our children is by firstly helping them develop a faith in themselves that faith in themselves, once that is established, you can just inform them that God exists and if they want to, they can have a relationship with God. And they'll do the rest. You, you barely need to do anything else after that. Of course, you still need to tra train them or, or teach them the laws of God. And, uh, and of course, remember that they are reflecting your own unhealed emotions. But that's a different discussion. If we're talking just about building our children's faith, build the faith in themselves, and give them a concept that God does exist, but they are allowed to choose whether they want their relationship or not. That's all that any nursing spirit in the spirit world does with any child in the first, you know, in the summer land. Yeah, that's all we need to do. Um, <clears throat> AJ, I feel uh, there's a spirit with me that wanted to ask this question. Mm. Um, the question is, if the underlying intention is to have a desire to know God and to want to change and they develop righteousness and truth and, and understanding that they are going to require some faith in themselves. Does developing these qualities of truth and righteousness and, and the gospel of peace then help them to have a relationship with God? It will greatly assist them in their relationship with God, but the primary thing that helps us in our relationship with God are the three points that we've always discussed, and that is our own humility to, able to be able to absorb our own nature and feel our own emotions, our own uh, desire for truth, a desire for universal truth, and more importantly, and the most importantly, the desire for God's love to enter me personally. It's the love that, of God that enters us personally that will establish the relationship. These qualities are important to combat the forces around us that do not want the relationship established. So these are the qualities that we need if we're going to have a, some kind of repulsion of the feelings and attitudes of the world and also much of the spirit world coming at us that are trying to influence us away from a relationship with God. 
So then can these qualities be developed for a spirit to help them combat the influence of others in the spirit world? Yes. These qualities are universal in nature and they have the same effect to everyone around us and that is they create a person who has some personal integrity, has some faith in themselves, has an honouring of the truth, has an honouring of ethics and this kind of a person is already ripe and open to having more of a relationship with God. If a person does not have those things, they have a lot of influence around them generally as a result that, that are taking them away constantly from any relationship with God. Okay. Yep. And uh, the question I had was when you were talking to Aurelia before about having um, developing our faith in God and, but needing to start from a humble place of faith in yourself... I had this feeling that it was the transition in having the focus always as our relationship with God to grow our faith, that it takes us from that place of self-reliance to God-reliance? Certainly it does. Okay. And, but we do need to understand that as we grow in our relationship with God, we will be, become very firm about what we do know. We're not going to be influenced very easily by others away from what we do know. In the first century, nobody else on the planet believed the same things I did. And even now, nobody else on the planet believes the same things I do. And that includes Mary and other people who are close to me. Nobody else believes the same things I do. But that doesn't mean I'm going to change my mind because that's my personal experience that I know for certain is true. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can try to convince me otherwise unless there is some logical argument that agrees with the reception of divine love that I can feel, I'm not going to change my mind. But it's not because I'm arrogant, it's just because I'm not going to change my mind from what I've already discovered to be true, through my personal experience. It's not what you think you know, it's what you have felt to Exactly, it's not what I think I know that I'm holding on to. When, with, with anything I think I know, I'm willing to change my mind instantly. Yeah, Mary will tell you that. Uh, but with anything I know for certain, you become unmovable. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And if we go, uh, was it Deb next and then up the back? And then Alison at the back, yep. yeah. Yeah. I'm really interested in this connection between um, faith in ourselves and faith in God. Yeah. And Mary alluded to something like that yesterday. I can't remember the point exactly. But it was, it's, I'm just interested that you talk more about this amazing connection, this amazing way God's created the universe that, that as, as it is for us, it's the same with our father. I don't know, there's some amazing stuff in there. Yeah. Well, I feel what a lot of people do, because of our religious uh, understandings and our background, see, the, the, even the country here in Australia is, comes basically from Christian understanding. So many of us, even though we may be atheists or even, uh, or, you know, no practicing religion, many of us still have very similar attitudes about God and about faith. And we've all, that, that we were brought, you know, the country was brought to in the 1700s, you know, or 1800s. And, and what we need to understand is that God has given us this ability a number of abilities actually, personal abilities that we need to honour. We need to honour these personal abilities. And if we're truly going to come to understand truth ourselves, we need to go through a personal process ourselves. We can't rely on the words of another person. You cannot rely on my words. You cannot. You need to go through a personal process of your own to discover truth. That is the reality. That is the only way you are going to discover truth. What I am sharing with you is how to do that. That's all. It's, it's a method. It's not, I'm not sharing you. With, I, in fact, I, I prefer to, to not share the truth, but the method of discovering the truth is my preference. That's what we talked about in the first century with everybody. That's what we're trying to talk about mostly now. Now, I'm perfectly willing to ask persons, answer persons' questions about what is truth, but you must understand I only know the answers because of a personal experience. And you are capable of having a similar personal experience and are capable of answering just as definitely through that personal experience as I am. So it doesn't mean, there's no superiority of a person just because they've had a personal experience you have not had. You are capable of having similar personal experience with God that will cause you to be able to answer every question you ever ask. I've had nobody telling me anything that I had to discover. Nobody. 
my history has been, for 2,000 years, has been that nobody has told me what I need to discover. So how did I discover it? Because I had a personal experience with God that I'm encouraging you to have. And if you have a personal experience that's similar, you will discover all the same things yourself through the experience. This is where you need to trust yourself more. You see? So you need to give up trusting me so much. You know, I'm not saying trust me. You know, you, you can see my nature. You can see my personality through years of interaction. That's one thing. I'm saying you need to give up trusting what I'm saying to you is truth and attempt to go through a personal experience to discover the truth for yourself. And what I'm suggesting is the fastest way to do that is the way that I've discovered to do it. But, but you don't have to believe me. You can try some other ways first if you want. That's all I'm suggesting. And this is the beauty of faith. If we start with some kind of personal conviction in ourselves that we are able to discover truth, that we are able to have a relationship with God, that we are able to have free will, that we are able to make our own choices and decisions, that we are able to take personal responsibility for our life, when we know we're able to do every one of those things, then we start to understand that we have enough personal power to actually establish this relationship with God. And we do not need another. You do not need a mediator. You do not need a teacher. God will become your teacher, just like God's become mine. I'm feeling really nervous now. <laughs> Um, my question relates to overcloaking. Mm -hmm. Do we only overcloak um, other spirits in a similar or lesser condition, or can we overcloak higher spirits? Um, you mean, can we overcloak higher spirits, or can higher spirits overcloak us? No, no, can we overcloak higher spirits? Like, can a spirit try and overcloak you? Um, it's very, very difficult for a lower spirit to overcloak a higher spirit. The reason why is the higher spirits have already learned all of these principles and a lower spirit does not know them. And so when a person who's in a lower condition tries to influence you in any way, you automatically feel the disharmony to the development of these qualities. Does that make sense? There's automatic disharmony. So I have never seen ever in my entire history a person of um, lower development, overcloaking a person of higher development. So, does that then come down to the fact that, um, like, if you're more highly developed, you can feel it happening, so you can stop it? Of course, you can feel it happening, but but your the condition of love that your soul is in stops it automatically. There are many people on earth who are overcloaked by spirits who they believe are in higher condition than themselves. And that is certainly possible, right? But, there are, but, but it's very, very difficult to be overcloaked by a person who's in a lower condition than yourself. Very difficult. You can be influenced yes, by them. Yes, make that distinction. Yeah. Which is a different matter. Because you might have one emotional injury that allows the influence. So let's say you have a high development of love, but you have a very dark emotional injury relating to sexuality then you can have a group of spirits who are in a lower condition than yourself influencing you just in that area. Yep. And they can certainly influence a lot of the things you do in that particular area. Yep. Does that answer your question, Alison? Yeah, it does. Yeah. But to be actually physically overcloaked by somebody permanently, a person has to be in a lot of agreement with the person who's overcloaking them. And, and if, if the person is, who's trying to do the overcloaking is in a lower condition, it's very hard for them to achieve such a thing. So then that just led me on to a segue. What's the difference between spirit influence and being overcloaked? Like how do you feel the difference? Well, if you can look at this entire uh, map here, can you see that, for example, we said our heart can be influenced un under some conditions. Our, our you know, loins, our sense of worth can be influenced under some conditions. As we'll learn, our thoughts can be influenced under some conditions. The faith protects us from the attacks that come. Right? And so the attacks can influence us under some condition. If we don't have our feet shod with the desire to go towards peace, the, the tendency towards violence can influence us under some conditions. 
These are all influences. Overcloaking is when a person spends most of their life completely overcloaked by another person, by a spirit. Now, there are some in the audience who are, who are like that, who are overcloaked and do not, are not aware of it because of the definite rapport that exists, but also because of, you know, most of, many of the times this overcloaking begins right at the time of birth and there's an acceptance in parents to allow it. You Can want to I, say? I feel that there is this case when a child is born, they can be overcloaked by someone in a lower condition. That is the only time it can occur. Yes, of course. Yeah. Because it's not the child's condition that determines the, the overcloaking, parents. it's the parents. So, so the only way for a child who is in a good condition to be overcloaked by a darker conditioned spirit is for the parents, through their attitudes, emotions and beliefs, to allow the influence to occur. Right? The parents establish the protection for the child. I think we've discussed that many times. Yeah. So, so in the case of a child, because the child does not have the mental cognizance necessary to understand these particular concepts, the child is not able to combat it, it, spirit influence on its own. And so it needs its parents' protection. But if the parents have not developed these qualities, now we've got an instance where a child can be overcloaked by a person in a darker condition. When you're overcloaked, you do, uh, your will is given away to the person who's overcloaking you. So they direct your actions, your words. Completely subservient. Yeah. You are really. Yeah. Yeah. So is that more of a long-term thing or it can just jump in and out? It, it, it is possible to jump in and out through experiences in our life. So, so a lot of people find they become overcloaked when they had an experience in their life where they just wanted to die and they just wanted to give up and they go through this thing and then all of a sudden some spirit comes to them, overcloaks them and now they feel like they know everything. Um, I think I read out in the uh, talk Spirit, Possession and Obsession, I read out a case of that. A man who's quite famous, who, who that actually happened to, um, who just became completely overcloaked through that experience. And, uh, you know, these experiences happen very, very regularly. In some countries, they happen at the time of birth very, very regularly because of the acceptance of spirits and spirit influence. There's often you read accounts of people in times of extreme stress where obviously they want to vacate and suddenly they have a blank in their memory and they come back and realise they've murdered someone or that something terrible has happened and that's, that's overcloaking. But that is a temporary overcloaking. Yeah. Some people have, are permanently overcloaked. Like I said, in our discussion in England with the 90 or so people that came, about 75 of them were overcloaked. They live their life in permanent state of being overcloaked. Yeah. So. How's the time? I time think it's time going, guys? One, one o'clock. Okay. Um, do you want to ask the two more questions? Or do you want to have lunch? Well, what the guys are going to do is probably they're going to start preparing for lunch now. So if we give them five minutes, so I'll keep talking for five minutes. And if the guys who are helping with preparing, Getting everything up. Right. Because yesterday when everyone went out there, you know what happened? You were so busy, you were doing it yourselves. <laughs> Unwrapping everything and they didn't have everything organised. In the future, actually, when we break for a lunch, can we just give them five minutes? To so set that, everything up. So they can yeah. set everything up and put everything out. There's definitely a feeling in Queensland about the food break. It's not the same other places we go, but here it's like, right, <laughs> we need food. This has been a confronting session. You've either I got need a some ferocious carb. appetite that's yeah. there, or something's going on. <laughs> um, if we can go to Max, uh, come here. Um, Max, yep. Yep. Just, uh, if you keep your hand up, Max. Hi, yep. AJ. Hi, Mary. Hi. Um, so... Sometimes I have out-of-body experiences and I know I'm out yep. and I get in a real tither. Yep. So what's happening with spirit influence in that? That's a temporary overcloaking? or? Well, there's a number of issues uh, going on when we have an out-of-body experience. We're not holding on to ethics for a start. We're not actually... If we were truly ethical in our nature, what we would do is we would always want to have our own experience no matter how painful or potentially painful it is. 
the only reason why we go out of our body is because we don't want to have our own experience, which is really not an ethical decision, is it? So there's an ethical issue related. There's also an issue of truth related in the sense that if I understood that the only way for me to work through issues truthfully is to stay present in my own body while I do it, then I would be very reticent to go out of my body at any point in time. In addition, there's an issue with our feet because whenever we go uh, into a situation that we then want to run away from, our feet are running away from something and, and the only reason why our feet would be running away is because we're afraid. And remember I said yesterday that that is not in harmony with peace but in, in harmony with violence, either towards ourselves or towards others. So can you see, even with just the things we've already learned, um, we are not, by, by going out of body, we have already broken quite a number of different principles that we've been discussing for the last day and a half. So what we need to do instead, Max, is to, is to have, a, have a direct feeling that we want to honour our personal experience. If you truly have worth and you truly love yourself, you will always wish to honour your personal experience no matter how painful. And the way you honour it is by being in it, by feeling it. That's how you honour yourself. You honour yourself by feeling your feelings and staying present with yourself at all times. As soon as you decide to get away from yourself, of course there will be spirits who want to come in, there will be other people who want to come in and influence you, and, and this is a very dangerous place for you in, in, in reality. Oftentimes we're trying to get out of our body because we think we're in a dangerous situation and we'd like to leave, right, but we can't physically do it. The reality is when we leave or go out, out of our body, you know, or try to go away from ourselves or not conscious of what we're feeling, what we're actually doing is exposing ourselves to more danger. So we need to understand that, that that's, the under, that's what's going on. And Max, um, similar to what we talked about yesterday, like if you discover, oh, I've gone away, you know, I've gone out of my body. I would, as um, AJ was talking to Josh about yesterday with this little um, graph, I you would go... the little graph? Where yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I'm out of body. I would go back to that point and go, what, that, I've done that many times. What was going on for me right then? What, who was around? What was, what was just about to happen? And that has helped me a lot to develop awareness of my fears. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if, if we do that, we'll be able to see. Just before I was, you know, I was in my body, I was feeling okay, I was present, and then all of a sudden I went away, then I'd have to go rewind a bit with my life and try to remember what happened just before I went away. Just before. This is like the benefits of self-reflection. It might, well, that's where we all have to start when we feel numb or not really aware. If we just, we realise, oh, I've, I've gone away or I've made a mistake, okay, let's go back to that point. And if I learn something about myself, then I can start to pray about that fear or that, that issue for myself. Yeah. yeah. Now, the next person I had was actually Thank Liam. You. So. Yeah. Thank you. Liam, down Liam, here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, with God's truth... Um, that's the same across the board for everyone, even though my personal experience in finding out the truth is different to your personal experience. Yes. We still come to the same conclusion. It's not like we have a personal slant on that truth. Exactly. Yeah. What will happen is that if you are absorbing God's truth eventually, and remember that the experience of doing so is personal to you. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying, is that you don't need anybody else to discover God's truth. But as you discover God's truth, you'll find that it'll be the same truth that other people who've done the same things have also discovered. Yeah. Yep. So it's different to an emotion where someone else, if everyone's learnt that truth, then they know that truth no matter the experience of getting there. Exactly. Which is yeah. different to emotion where you can have a similar experience but it's always a different emotion. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So our emotions are our own. Other people often have similar emotions and we can often feel the type of emotion they have. But I can't take away Mary's emotion. Mm -hmm. she, can, she can voice it with me, expect me to sit with her and listen to everything. <laughs> I've never and done all that, of those things, by the way. Right? And, and it does nothing for her. Nothing. 
<laughs> and all it does is take up my time. <laughs> does that make sense? Because I, I can't have the experience for her. It's her experience. It's the experience she needs to have for herself. So that's very different. Once she's gone through that experience, she'll discover some truths that I already know because I've also had to go through similar experiences to discover those truths. And, and as a result, we will get closer, even though it's her personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why everyone in the celestial spheres feels very close to each other, because they've all discovered the same truths through hundreds and hundreds of thousands of millions of different processes. So um, really, the higher you go, you're... Learning the same, you're going to a place where everyone else knows the same thing as you until you go to the next place. Yeah, that's correct. But you must bear in mind that everyone has an individual will still. Yeah. And, and the beauty is because you've grown to a new location, you have more freedom. So you actually have more freedom to express your will in the directions you want while at the same time understanding the same truths that everybody else does. Yeah. Your personality, like you have your own personality, so your desire oh, is expressed in a yeah, different way. Yeah, I didn't way. expect we all started looking, looking and the being same. the same. No, no, yeah. no, no yeah. it's not like yeah. that at all. Yeah. yeah. So it's a good, good question though, yeah. 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 So once we go through that process, we're in this celestial, once we become at one with God, we're in this sort of celestial spirit state where we're, we're expressing our will exactly how we want to be but as soon as you meet another person you can have a fantastic discussion about certain things because they already know what you're talking about <laughs> right and so because and I've had the same personal experience and you you both bring your personality to the table which is fantastic because you get to know each other's individual nature and it's just a wonderful experience being able to converse with people who have exactly the same, per not the exact same personal experience, but exactly the same knowledge of God's absolute truth. It's just a wonderful discussion. And you're right, on the way, as you're you know, going on the way, then you get to talk to people who have the same kind of grounding and you're all launching off into the next discovery together. So you, you don't have to waste time on the philosophical argument. You can go, right, this is what we know. What more is there to learn, you know? And it's yeah. very beautiful. I so, miss it. So, that, you know, on earth how, with regard to truth, everyone wants to argue with you about it, right? You know, yeah. like, you know... We, we present all of these uh, things for free on the net. You'd be surprised how many emails we get. Why aren't you putting a comment for us there on the, on the net? And I say, because I don't want to hear your comments. <laughs> That's the reality, right? Uh, uh, well, you know, why would you want to hear somebody's comment when all you know they're going to do is just have a heap of attack, verbal abuse, whatever, whatever. And, uh, and in the end, it's something I already know anyway. Like, I, I don't... Like, I'd love to have a discussion with, something, with somebody about something I don't already know, and that's fine by me, but, but, but a, person who, a person who's trying to discuss something with me that I already know and is trying to criticise it, I just say, well, you haven't had the personal experience yet. That's fine, but I, I have, so I, I can't agree with you, and it's a pointless discussion, really. Um, but if there's somebody who, who has had more personal experience than I have, I'd love to sit down with them. In fact, if it was me, I'd be sitting down with them every day if possible, right? <laughs> if they would allow me that time. Um, because I'd love to find out what they, what they know and understand and actually how they got to the point of knowing and understanding those particular things. I feel, though, that most of us want to voice our opinion to others whether we know or not. And that is a big issue we face on the planet. And this is one of the things you don't experience in the higher spheres of the spirit world. Everybody knows the truth that they already know. So they're not arguing about it. <laughs> Here on earth, everyone wants to argue, whether they know or not. And, uh, and that, I feel, is a big impediment to discovering more truth. If we all had a cooperative effort in discovering truth rather than attacking, if we all had a questioning nature rather than attacking nature, then it would be easy to have these discussions on earth. But the problem is many of us have a violent attacking nature because we have all these unhealed emotions inside of us that cause us to believe that our opinion is true even though it's not the truth of God. And as a result of that, we want to convince everybody else that you know, our, our error-based position that's based around violence in our childhood and all these other things is true. And, and a person who's gone through all of that can't, can't believe you that it's true. They can't accept that it is, what you're saying is true, no matter how much you try to convince them and how much you swear at them and no matter how much you curse them. They still won't. And no matter how much you attack them and no matter how violent you are towards them, they're still not going to be able to accept it. 
And, uh, and this is the thing, is that error always wishes to attack. Truth always wishes to enlighten. All right? And that's something that you learn after a while. So, so after a while, you learn that you can put things out there and just let it take its course, and you don't have to hear all the responses. <laughs> it's up to every person how they respond. I have no control over that. You have no control over it. You don't even have any control over how your wife responds. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> so, so how can you have control over anybody else? You don't have any control over how your children respond. How can you have control over anyone else? The reality is all we need to do is explain what we feel we know and other people will be either attracted to that or not based on their personal experience. Yeah. Let's have a break now. Sorry, guys. Let's have a break. Otherwise, we'll keep talking forever. Uh, so let's have a break for um, uh, till, till 2 o'clock. Can we come back at 2? Thanks. <laughs>